so good morning and, and thank you all for joining the uh, MOBI community lecture. My name is Rajat Rasmandari. I'm the working group's lead at MOBI. The title of today's presentation is Decentralized Cooperative Autonomy and the Transportation Infrastructure. Um, the lecture presents a paradigm of how to represent, update, and optimize vehicle-based trust management, uh, as well as the integral role the transportation infrastructure itself can play to influence and incentivize safe, predictable, and efficient roadway operations. Um, so today's speaker is Dr. Carl Linderlich. He's the Director of Surface Transportation Division at Nobis in Washington, DC. He's a key contributor to both R&D projects and technology deployment programs sponsored by the US DOT and the Federal Highway Administration. Uh, Carl is an expert in the use of simulation techniques to evaluate the potential impact of emerging technologies to improve traveler mobility or, uh, and system productivity, including vehicle connectivity, autonomy, and blockchain. He's a published author and patent holder in orchestrated autonomy, which leverages blockchain to create efficient and collision-free path planning among heterogeneous, unfamiliar autonomous uh, vehicles and machines. Um, before I um, hand it over to Carl. Uh, please deposit your questions in the chat box uh, um, anytime during the presentation. Um, and depending on how many questions we receive, we may pause the presentation to answer some of them. If not, then we'll have about 15, 20 minutes left at the, towards the end of the presentation to answer your questions. So with that, Carl, all yours. Great, thanks so much. Uh, thank you for that uh, that intro. Very wordy, I guess. I think I wrote it. Uh, so uh, to hear it come back, <laughs> it's it, it's, a, it's about it's a mouthful. Uh, but in any case, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I know folks are joining from all around. Uh, to and I thank you for taking the time to to um, listen in to our my lecture today. Uh, it, it, as Rajat has pointed out, uh, this is a, a piece of work that uh, at Novelist that we've been exploring for the last couple of years. Uh, the notion of how uh, blockchain technology, distributed ledger, can be utilized to generate um, very effective and safe and efficient um, uh, technical maneuver plans and the kinds of benefits that provides uh, potentially to uh, the roadway infrastructure system uh, in terms of its financing, its efficiency, and its, and its safety. So I, I will uh, let everybody know that uh, I, I did give a talk uh, on some of the uh, parts of this topic that I'm going to kind of skip over today or just summarize related to the, the basic concept of orchestrated autonomy, this decentralized cooperative autonomy concept. I will cover enough just to, to get us to the, to the extension here. Um, the, the basic point is that if you, if you can generate transactions among uh, automated vehicles or even manned uh, human driven vehicles and automated vehicles to generate collective maneuver planning, uh, there can be significant impacts, both uh, benefits in terms of safety and, and mobility, uh, allowing the infrastructure to be used in interesting and new and efficient ways, depending on how the machines can uh, effectively do that. So, so all that is, is terrific. I did start to get some questions both last uh, time I appeared in the, this forum, which was terrific. Uh, so, you know, please, I, I put a, uh, a note there. Feel free to use that um, chat pod to, to uh, let me know if there's anything that strikes your imagination or your clarification that's required. Because honestly, this, this talk came out of some of the questions I got in that uh, briefing a couple of years ago, and as well as the follow up to it related to um, this notion of trust and uh, how it actually might work together with fault to create a, a self-incentivizing organizing system that would yield even more benefits in terms of safety, efficiency, and financial sustainability for the, for the roadway system. Uh, as Rajat pointed out, um, Novus itself, we are a, a not-for-profit uh, system engineering and science and technology firm located in the Washington DC area. Our clients are mostly the federal government and my job in particular is to be on the lookout for emerging technologies, the convergence of uh, multiple uh, emerging technologies that can have a transformative effect on the way that big shared infrastructure systems uh, like our roadway system uh, might be uh, operated in the future. And so that's 
the, the germ of this particular talk and this particular line of research that I'm going to relate to you to today. Okay, so that's a very, very long introduction. I'll move off our title slide. Uh, I typically do this if, if you, I'm going to try to give you uh, one, my whole talk in, in, uh, in one slide here for in less than five minutes. Uh, it, in just in case you, you need to leave or in case you, you're wondering whether it's worth your time to listen today. So um, what I'd like to talk about today is this, this notion of starting from the basics and it's a little bit of a repeat for those who have heard some of this before, the first uh, two points, but they're critical ones really to, to getting to this notion of what is trust and what is fault in such a system. That's where we're trying to get to the newer material today. Number one is that if you have uh, autonomous vehicles operating on a roadway system, uh, their deconfliction of their motion paths requires prioritization of vehicle movement. And uh, as I talked a little bit about before, right now we're really highly dependent on legacy mechanism ba based and, uh, and, and constrained by human capabilities to perceive uh, and communicate uh, and share intent in that system to organize and establish uh, that priority. So for example, things like rules of the road, like, well, a stop sign means stop and green uh, means go. And you know, when four vehicles approach or when multiple vehicles approach an intersection, the right-hand turn has preference before left. Uh, and if you start to write down all the rules of the road, you, you have a, a tremendous list of expectations, but essentially that system developed ad hoc over more than 100 years of human automobility is the basis for which the autonomous vehicles are operate in right now when they're a significant minority compared to human driven vehicles. Uh, but the supposition of orchestrated autonomy in all of our research is, is such a legacy human uh, derived system ad hoc not en <laughs> ad hoc engineered system over 100 years of automobility as a species, really the, the right one for, uh, for machines that have different capabilities, different abilities to sense and communicate than, than humans. Okay, so if, if we, from that position say, well, what else could we do? Then we have to start looking at very, some very basic concepts like, well, priority is a requirement for a shared infrastructure, someone, some vehicle has to have priority, but uh, priority and, and the ability to, my point number two here, priority and, and ability to, to generate uh, maneuver, tactical maneuver plans in an intersection, merge, weave area, any other place in the roadway infrastructure cannot exist without trust. Right now we have trust that uh, you know, we go out there and, and drive our vehicles. We try to do defensive driving for sure, but for the most part, we assume that everybody uh, around us in their vehicles know the rules of the road. We anticipate that they will do that. They will act in a predictable way and that the ways that we trust them to ma maneuver and behave will be consistent with what we have seen in the past if we make uh, decisions uh, based on that. If we, there was really zero trust in the system, if, if suddenly we all lost our collective memory and we went out there and tried to utilize that system without a, a standard understanding of how priority is established, then we have a super inefficient system. You can imagine creeping across intersections, kind of like exiting a stadium after a big uh, football game or something, gives you a sense of how uh, that, when we remove the rule sets from society, the kinds of chaos that, uh, that you get from, from such a system. But anyway, no rules is a, actually a terrible way of going, but how can we look at a different set of rules uh, and how can we generate uh, machine driven and machine specific uh, maneuver planning that exploits their capabilities over uh, limitations of human drivers. Uh, so that's really what uh, the, the second point about, and I'll, I'll explain a little bit more about this, uh, basically how we, we leave the human legacy rules of priority behind and establish new forms of priority using uh, negotiation uh, over shared space in something we call orchestrated autonomy. Okay, so that's the first two points. But all of that uh, you know, only works if there's trust, right? If there's trust built into the system, even the machines, uh, no matter how wonderful they are, have to actually be able to trust that the other machines around them will act in predictable uh, ways, right? So uh, if you don't have trust, then you, you have the same problem if humans don't have trust. Essentially, it's basically the same. Just being a machine doesn't solve that problem. And point number three is that failure to adhere to a maneuver plan, so this idea of breaking trust, has implications for both trust and fault. Yeah, so I'll, I'll talk a little bit. This is basically some of the extensions that 
people were asking me about after the last talk I gave, what are the implications? What are the difference between trust and fault? And how do these um, two different uh, types of uh, conceptual frameworks uh, work in different ways to encourage long, well, both tactical safety and efficiency, but also long-term uh, safety, efficiency, and financial sustainability within the um, whole roadway system. So to do that, I'm going to jump in on, on number four here. The key point is that there's a big difference between trust and fault. And I'll, I'll give away the, the punchline here in that trust is actually a forward-looking component. Like how much we trust someone may change over time, but it's always that the, whatever the setting is for us uh, as humans, it always relates to, well, I'll never trust, you know, that person in the future, I'll never give them $100 again because they didn't pay me back. You know, it's always about the future, right? Trust is inherently a forward-looking uh, prospective uh, assessment of what will happen in the future. Whereas fault is always retrospective. Retrospective looks back and says, who was at fault for something that went wrong in, in the past? So although I've talked a lot about trust management, earned management previously, and I'll, I'll cover some of that again, the new material I'll, I'll talk about today for sure is this notion of how trust and fault together, both this prospective utilization of trust, as well as a retrospective assessment of fault in ways that machines can change the dynamic and change the way that we think of fault, assess fault, and compensate those who are harmed when, they're, uh, when there's a fault in the system, how those two things together, uh, carrot and stick approach, can be used to improve and, and set up sort of an evolutionary ecosystem in which safety, efficiency, uh, equity, uh, and financial sustainability are all built together um, in, a, in a successful, hopefully successful framework to overall improvement. So how we generate value and assign fault within such a system is critical. And if we do it based on sort of the legacy ways that we have now, we don't really set up a system in which it actually encourages uh, in a incremental or overall evolutionary improvement in, in the system efficiency. It kind of like limits it to what we have now as humans. Um, and so the so what statement at the end here is like, so so great, Carl, hooray, tr value, fault, very interesting. But what's the what's the bottom line? Why would anybody even care about taking, you know, taking these steps and moving to a different paradigm for uh, how we share uh, this infrastructure? And the answer is based on research that we've done at Nova, some of the work we've done, uh, and, and, and we actually have a recent publication in this area, we, we think that if done correctly and managed correctly and engineered honestly, rather than just sort of this ad hoc system that we've inherited as a species over 100 years, um, we can get, we can at least cut roadway crashes by a factor of 10 uh, and fatalities as well and quadruple uh, system productivity and roadway safety in a system that pays for itself, utilizing only the um, current roadway right-of-way that we have currently. But the utilization of that right-of-way would look significantly different than the way it does now under the human paradigm. Okay, so that's that's my talk. So you know, thank you for coming. Uh, if, if, the, if you wanna know more, I'm gonna talk about each of these points a little bit more uh, detail to, to drive down to this so what moment here at the end. Okay, no comments in the question. All right, but please, you know, feel free to throw some comments in there. All right, so at the high level, um, this this notion of you know, what kind of system are, are we thinking about at Noblis? Is it is it the sort of near-term situation with mostly human drivers and a few uh, uh, autonomous or uh, partially autonomous vehicles in the system? And actually, right now, we're thinking a little bit further out. So we are interested in um, broadly at Noblis, but specifically for the, this audience here, uh, autonomous systems that are uh, have these four um, these four capabilities or att attributes. So the first is that they have entities in it that are autonomous, so capable of some in, in, imperfect, independent form of sensing and maneuvering. They have no godlike uh, ability to see the whole system themselves; they only see locally. And make uh, maneuver. Uh, they may make uh, sense and, and maneuver plans based on that. Uh, we we tip our cap to the fact that in a big roadway system or any of these big shared systems, when autonomy is applied at scale, that there's going to be a lot of heterogeneous uh, machines in the system. So so for the roadway uh, case, for the civilian surface case, they they may differ significantly in size, their ability to maneuver, like that big truck that's sitting next there next to the burrito bot. 
uh, acceleration, deceleration. Uh, they have very different uh, potential trip paths and uh, operating parameters they want to go, they want them to move along. Uh, and they're owned by different entities, right? Uh, and there are a variety of urgency. So a ambulance in a system is very different than a burrito bot, uh, is very different than a person trying to get to work. So we have to recognize all the heterogeneity, uh, both in terms of the capability of the machines themselves, but also to the purposes to which they're put uh, within the system. And not in this case, not all trips are created equal, uh, but they need to be adjudicated in, in an equitable way so that the priority is allocated. And for those who provide uh, that yield to provide um, access to those who need priority, that they're compensated appropriately. Uh, the other critical thing for the, the civilian thing, I, I think everybody would just assume this, but I like to throw it in, is that we assume that in this system that it's non-adversarial, that the overall intent of all these machines is essentially not to you know, go about their business and not collide with each other. Um, there's another different and interesting talk I can give about managing adversarial uh, machines within such a system. But for right now, uh, for the simplicity of this talk today, we're going to assume that uh, we're, we're not we're not having to isolate and deal with uh, adversarial machines within the system. So it's like routine operations with machines and uh, program for uh, benign intent and shared utilization of the infrastructure. And the last critical thing is that the way that tactical maneuvering uh, is conducted is a series of ad hoc interactions. We use a, in our lab, I'll show you some examples with our with rovers that we use as examples uh, for this topic. Uh, that they have many time limited and very small group, uh, uh, very small group encounters between you know six and ten machines, in some cases just two machines, uh, working out how they're going to uh, share space, and they rarely see the same machine again. Not true for all rovers; they see the same rovers again and again. That's part of the uh, that's part of our lab experience. But in the in the grand scheme of things, uh, if you have a vehicle in your own personal life, you drive it around, you you are not seeing the exact same uh, people and, and machines every single day. You may see it once in a while, but for the most part, on a long trip, the you will never you will not know 99% uh, of that pool. That population is large, but the set of uh, encounters are with a very small group. So it's critical to know that if you're going to be trying to maneuver in and around people, uh, other vehicles, let's say, uh, you need to know how much you can trust them, right? So the the notion is you there's is not possible to know everyone in the population. Uh, but it is important to know how much you can trust them when you make high-speed maneuvers in and around them in terms of how much you can trust uh, them to maneuver uh, with precision and accuracy relative to, to your, uh, your machine. So now I'm going to step back a little bit now and, and jump into the lab because uh, it's, it's very hard to, to illustrate some of these critical points uh, with a big complex system like our, our roadway system. So we use some of these uh, simple examples where uh, the 2D plane, we've got little rovers running on it. We put some obstructions out there. And you can see just from the diagram here, uh, the rovers, uh, they're called autonomous machines here, but they're really just uh, little rovers. Uh, they have some capability to sense. They're not the world's greatest little rotors, but they, they certainly can have a variety of uh, sensors on them. They can maneuver, uh, they can sense around them about one grid block uh, distance from each other pretty pretty effectively. Uh, beyond that, they, they don't have much capability to do so. But in this case, we'll put four of them essentially in this arena and give them each sort of random waypoint paths that they need to hit with rewards to, to uh, for each one of the waypoints that they, they hit in, in sequence. And so they're, in, they're incentivized essentially to hit as many waypoints as efficiently as possible, but they have to share space with each other. And no machine has any idea what the other machines will do unless we connect them and orchestrate their motions, right? So the, uh, in this case, for example, uh, if you look at, uh, if, it's, if it's clear enough, you can see that some of this is pretty small. Uh, Rover B, in this case, is trying to go from where it is currently on the right-hand side across the, the grid to get to waypoint four. Uh, but it's naturally going to be in contention with A and D, who also look like they want to use the center of the of our uh, maneuver space at the same time. So uh, just to give a sense of how this all plays out, first the rovers themselves make a path plan uh, independent of anybody else's uh, any any other rovers uh, path in the in the system. So 
first in unconstrained path planning, you can see A, D, and B all kind of want to use the center, so there may be some problem there. And, and indeed, those machines at this point are not um, trustworthy enough to maneuver past each other, three of them in the center there, they're actually too big, the, the high risk of collision. So it's identified as a, a conflict that they can't all share that uh, that space in the in the 15 second maneuver horizon. And, and, and for those who have their microscopes out, these uh, like, for example, B, the plan here would be like move forward B5 is where they'd be five seconds into the uh, into the maneuver. And at 10 seconds, there's this notion that there's potentially a collision in the in the second uh, in this very center of this uh, space between all three rovers. So we have to make a, a plan, right? So deconfliction is not possible without establishing priority. We could just let these guys loose, not, co not coordinate. What happens is they get to the center, they balk around each other for a while, and then they give up and kind of return to where they are. So essentially no efficiency, it's highly unsafe. They often collide when that's the, the case, and they don't really hit each other that hard, but they don't, uh, it's not efficient in any way. Um, but what we have to do in terms of planning, now we connect them up, we have them organize and try to create a joint maneuver plan or collective maneuver plan. We, we have to avoid the situation where, hey, by the way, two machines cannot occupy the same space at the same time, that, that, that that's called a collision, right? And in this case, we need to leave a significant or enough of a buffer around them so that we can't get them too close or they, they may collide just because of that. So in this case, uh, A, D, and B, somebody, you know, so only one machine can have priority and the others much, uh, must yield and replan. And there's a, there's a tremendous number of ways to, to do priority. Uh, and in fact, I, I, if you look on my LinkedIn page, there's a link to a recent publication in a, in a Nature, uh, a, a Springer uh, book uh, uh, about multiple different ways about how priority can be determined. And I go through a whole series of, and really, but in the end, the, the most efficient way is for the machines to negotiate of the space. It's not something that humans can do well, but things that machines can do well is negotiate over dynamic space. In our lab, our rovers uh, negotiate over square centimeter spaces. Uh, they're, they're bigger than square centimeters, by the way, but they divvy up the, uh, the whole maneuver space by square centimeter by second. Uh, so that they can know where those machines, other machines are and who will be where, when, uh, and they do all this uh, on their own in an autonomous way without any uh, intervention by any human. But in this case, we're gonna talk about negotiated priority, which is part of our solution, which I think is the most efficient and most effective and has a whole bunch of side benefits that we're gonna talk about here later. Uh, we'll, talk about, we'll talk about priority determined by negotiation. So we are leaving out, like the rovers don't have signals, the rovers don't drive on the right-hand side of the road, the rovers have no rules of the road. Uh, they only can invent them themselves through these uh, this constraint of the negotiated plan. All right, so that's where we are currently. We're going to negotiate over the over the space. But if here's where trust falls into the equation. So you have to have um, earned trust to be able to do any of this. Because if you if you make a plan and say okay A is going to go first, but then B and D just roar into the center, it doesn't make any sense, right? There's there's no there's no benefit to do any planning if there's no trust that they're going to uh, actually follow that. So in the end, I'll just sort of jump to the, to the main point here is that if you have a system in which uh, we can establish trust and carry that trust from transaction to transaction, from episodic encounter to episodic encounter, then we can learn about how much can we trust these other machines if we can trust them well enough to establish priority, which is at the minimum level, then we can establish a maneuver plan based on that. So this notion of trust is a level of maneuverability, uh, a, a, a reliability and maneuver, as well as reliability and sensation that can be transferred from one episodic encounter to another. Okay, uh, so uh, very quickly, the negotiation of the spared, shared, shared space, uh, in this case, A has the highest yield in terms of how many points it's gonna get for getting to two. So it gets, it essentially bids gets the, um, we use a very simple Dutch auction system, very rapid for the, uh, it, it, A gets the space, it, it has the priority, uh, but it compensates the other two machines, D and B, that, uh, um, that, that yield essentially to it. So whatever that bid is, that value that's generated here, it's eight units of something, uh, then that, 
that yield uh, can be distributed uh, among all of the entities in the system that yield it as well as other parts of the e ecosystem that contribute to the negotiation. Uh, leave that for now. But anyway, so this idea that there's is priority is established and there's value established at the same time. Um, and so then you have a maneuver plan. So here's a maneuver plan after the after four rounds actually of, of figuring out how to do deconfliction among all the machines. What it looks like is that A uh, does get priority, goes all the way from top to bottom, uh, straight through the center. Uh, Rover B advances to its position there near the center, waits uh, until time 10 seconds after A passes and then rolls through further on uh, across towards waypoint four. Whereas rover D just essentially gets out of the way uh, by circling off uh, counterclockwise uh, towards waypoint one. So all this is very interesting. Uh, it is deconflicted, it's very safe, uh, but it also yields these elements of, okay, who gets paid and who, who receives payment and who pays into the system. So here's, I guess, the, the part I wanted to get to today. And I see I've, I've gone a little long already but the execution may not go according to plan. So it's all great when it, when it happens uh, that every machine performs exactly according to the plan over the 15 seconds. Uh, the reality doesn't look like that. Our rovers don't look like that. Uh, let's see, Ben says, wasn't he trying to get to waypoint three, not to one? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So great point, uh, Ben, I'm gonna go back here. So in the maneuver planning, uh, it, it, D chooses not to bid high enough like the reward it gets for going to three is actually pretty small. Uh, where's that? Anyway, I guess I won't try to find it. Um, so, so Ben, yes, it does want to go to three, but since A paid for the priority to go through the center and then B pay, has the second highest uh, bid to go across the, the, from essentially right to left through the center, D, the only thing it can do to try to get towards waypoint three is to is maneuver around either the top or the bottom. And since C is down at the bottom, it's chosen to go up around towards waypoint one, eventually taking the long route down to three. So hopefully that makes some sense. So D, in this case, uh, gets out of the way. It's yielded twice. So those two blue hexagons you see in terms of the pay and yield, it, it's entitled to two portions of compensation for yielding twice. Um, all right, so, but the, what if A's bad move was not A's fault, the dog may, oh great, yeah, so great point, Lynn. I'm gonna come back to that one in just a second. So now we're gonna talk about A going off plan, right? So A overshoots and heads into the center uh, early, right? Uh, and what happens is since the rovers can detect what's going on in about a one uh, square away from each other, Rover B can report that A is out of position. A may also self-report like, whoops, uh, I'm out of position. Um, but by the way, if C had made a similar maneuver error, we'd never know about it because it's kind of like the, there's no other verifying entity unless C self-reported it. There's no other verifying entity currently in the system to identify it. But in this case, we have at least one, if not two reports that uh, A has done something um, uh, correct, right? So, so now we're gonna talk a little bit about what that might mean in terms of trust and fault. So the deviation of rover A from the plan does not in the end. So here's what, how, how the maneuver turns out. A realizes where it is, slows down, gets to where it was supposed to be at 10 and then finishes uh, getting at time 15 down at waypoint two. It does not obstruct B. B is allowed to move through and C and D actually do their thing. It's not a, no problem. So. Uh, rover A recovers uh, in the next five seconds, all the rovers ended up where they expect to be. So what are the implications for trust? So here in terms of trust, the rover A should be somewhat less trusted in the future. Uh, and we actually adjust a score for them based on how much space they have to buy in the system and how much uh, leeway uh, they have to have around the machine. Uh, whereas B, D and C, uh, can actually can shrink that down a little bit because they did perform exactly as they uh, as they perform. So you see that Rover A there gets a red or like a pink, a light pink demerit for maneuver. Its sensation was fine, so that's why it's got a green one. Uh, but uh, so for so there's a slight ding for A in future interactions uh, because of the fact that it overshot. Uh, 
the implications for fault are marginal, right? Because there, since the transaction was completed without end state deviation, no rover suffered harm of any type. So here we use this, the soft mechanism of trust to help improve future episodic uh, encounters and planning by saying A needs to reserve more space. Okay, great. I see we have a couple of comments, but I'm gonna actually just finish off with the trust and fault and then I'll take the comments in the, in the, pod, in the, in the, in the pod there. Um, okay, so the point I made earlier, I'm gonna make here again is that our trust considerations in this kind of marginally problematic case where A just kind of overshoots a little bit is that we, it does impact trust because trust says, what, ha, what, will, what should you know about the future? But in fault, we're only looking retrospectively, like who, who was harmed and how can those that have suffered harm be compensated? And, and I guess the other interesting thing is who says or how, what's the certainty that we can objectively say that there's an allocation of fault to one or more machines? Okay, so what's interesting is that the maneuver plan itself, as well as potentially supporting infrastructure, can help to both inform trust as well as verify and validate the certainty of fault. Okay. All right, we'll just do this one and I'll take the stuff in the pot. All right, so let's let's assume now that uh, it's A is actually okay uh, and B is the is the problem. So it's a, a different alternative outcome. It's not like the one before. In this case, consider the where rover B overshoots its waypoint and actually collides with, with rover A, which can happen, does happen uh, absolutely in the lab. Uh, in this case, our fault, the, our fault and trust considerations are more serious, right? Uh, but the fact that we can verify that B is out of position, A can report that, B can self-report it. Uh, Rover A, although it had paid essentially in the smart contract that it was going to get the priority, it shouldn't have to pay that anymore because it never got priority. In fact, it got disabled. Can you guys still hear me? Grace, you still there? Yeah. We, we can okay, yeah, that. I had a little trouble with my headset here. Um, so in this case, we can uh, take a look at the allocation of in, in fault, essentially, within the compensation as an endpoint of the smart transaction, blockchain-enabled and transaction. So Rover B has allocated the cost of paying eight units for the ruined plan, because D did that we talked about before, Ben, I've noticed like D makes this roundabout way. It probably could have gone through and uh, if had known there's gonna be a collision. But the, but the point is that D should still be compensated because it yielded for no particular reason, except for that was the plan. B is responsible. So it would have to pay that plus whatever the costs are uh, incurred by disabling A. Uh, and our trust scores, we would give uh, the, a bright red trust reduction to B because not only did they overshoot, but they were unable to avoid a uh, uh, very close encounter uh, and ended up with a collision. So there's gradation on binary trust and gradation in fault uh, in terms of identifying. So this incentivizes, by the way, don't collide. You know, if you do go off route, that's less of a penalty than if uh, you actually collided with something. All right. So yeah, I'll, I'll actually, I'll, I'll go take the questions here first because we, we talked a lot about these rovers. All right, so Lynn uh, pointed out here, what if A's bad move was not A's fault? A dog may have run into the path during the move. So that's actually a great question. Um, I will say that, you know, who's to say, you know, I guess the question was, how do we know that it was uh, a dog or a, a third, like a, a, what we call a dark object in the system, like not connected in the system that, that caused that? So in this case, if B and A could verify that that thing was in the system or there was an infrastructure-based uh, beacon or camera that could validate that, then A could be uh, released from fault, right? Uh, and as well as uh, lack of trust, right? So in this case, that illumination of the space and understanding what was actually also there could be integrated into the uh, result of the transaction um, so it's an ex excellent point, but it's like a it's a sidebar essentially to the contract that's made uh, in terms of uh, dark object uh, interference. Uh, but in this case, yeah, that's an external third party thing. So essentially, everyone would be essentially held faultless. A would not uh, they would not be held 
it would have a less of an impact in trust. In fact, it might get a plus up in trust and would not be held as fault. Uh, Roger asked the question, in the current setup, the rovers were not programmed with the rules of the road or the possibility of stop signs. That's correct. It was just strictly, they see open square centimeters of space and then they allocate those uh, among themselves at one second intervals. Uh, and then he also asked the question, does the Dutch auction work in terms of getting incentives by a rover to another rover? Yes, uh, absolutely. So uh, when the contract is completed here, uh, I'll go back to the one where there's not a collision. Here, here. Uh, after four rounds of uh, figuring out who's going to get priority, in the end, uh, B, let's just say, uh, B in this case, uh, ye does not, it, it yields on the first round to A, but takes priority over D in the second round. So it ends up with a net zero. And, and a rover D, which you yields twice essentially by the center, is the one that reaps all of the benefit in terms of the, of the value. So as a part of this contract, a pays eight in, and then D receives uh, up to eight uh, in compensation. I always say up to eight because we also compensate the, the mechanisms that provide the blockchain and the other kinds of stuff, the roadway itself. So there's a ecosystem payment, but the D is compensated based on the, the, uh, what has been paid by A. All right, so we're at 1039. I will jump into the, the idea about the infrastructure here just as a way of bringing that together. So this is kind of related to Lynn's question. So what's also interesting here is that, you know, we have all sorts of sensation devices and communication support devices built into our roadway systems already, but they're only there and compensated and utilized uh, in like uh, completely separate from the system itself. So the, the value generated by the roadway system is separate and apart completely from the mechanisms that fund uh, the roadways themselves, as well as the infrastructure around it that keeps it safe, right? And we think that's particularly problematic because the fuel tax is uh, no longer a viable way of maintaining this infrastructure. And so that we need to find uh, new and innovative ways to do so. So as a talk I gave a while ago, and in fact, there's a paper on that one too, if you check my link, LinkedIn site, we, we posit how much benefit, uh, how much of this value generation equation could be then redistributed back, not just to the machines that yield, but also to the infrastructure itself to help pay for the infrastructure to help supplement or in, and in fact, eventually replace uh, the fuel tax. So that's an interesting uh, topic, but also not one for, for today. Uh, in this case, a secondary form of uh, compensation and a role for the infrastructure would be to do third-party verification because you know sensor A, sensor B, it's a bit of a, a sensors from, on rover A, sensors on rover B may tell a different story. Honestly, you know they, these machines don't make mistakes, quote unquote. They uh, they react uh, to uncertainties in different ways. And so, if one tried to sort of uh, look at the reasons why B overshot and caused a collision. From the rover B's perspective, it might be completely logical. There's no way that it could have expected A to be there because, for example, its positioning was completely out of whack. All right, so, but in this case, the, the third party helps to solve that problem. So other rovers that happen to be close enough to, to, to help adjudicate fault uh, could be part of this equation, uh, as well as infrastructure that helps to adjudicate and identify fault. Uh, the last thing I'll say about that is that fault is also not uh, binary, right? So there's a certainty to which we can associate fault within the system that can be calculated from the outcomes and the inputs from the various players. And so, for example, we might find B85% at fault uh, for this particular encounter, uh, which might be serious enough that it's, you know, it's essentially treated as 100% fault. But we may choose a policy that says anything where it's not 51% certain or higher that we can't allocate economic damages or other damages to a machine that can only be held you know 50 and 50 percent uh fault or lower so i think it's actually very interesting because humans are only really programmed for uh fault that is either yes or no whereas machines and the way we calculate and use the sensor information we can calculate non-binary uh, uh we get continuous valued essentially fault within the system. And I think that's super interesting in terms of how you manage a, a system like this. 
Uh, I'll mention here just real quickly, and I'll just take comments after that if there are anybody else has additional ones to offer that I've given just a flavor of our uh, Nobles orchestrated autonomy concept, which is to take these multi-machine transactions and produce uh, trust reports, uh, manage those over time, feed those trust reports back into any new episodic encounters, and then use verification and other entities within the system to, to manage both fault and trust. So this uh, the pieces of a trust consortium, it's a term we use, the trust consortium notion here is uh, really manages trust, right? That That's its notion. Right now, the, the blockchain system does not itself monitor and allocate uh, fault. That's not, that's not the way uh, we have it currently configured. However, by essentially looking at failed transactions encoded onto the, the ledger, then you know, fault can be derived from it. So they essentially be another user group uh, coming out of the, uh, the consortium, looking at those transactions and the after action reports with verification allows uh, a fault to be assigned as well as trust managed going forward. All right, so 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 what? Hooray, Carl! You're punishing, you're you're establishing trust and 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 assigning fault to rovers in your lab. You know we don't care. They, I, I can certainly understand that because they, they're just examples. But the way that we currently encourage good behavior and discourage bad behavior is very uh, again binary. Right? We give out tickets, we put people in jail, we revoke their licenses. <laughs> But we we don't give them so the incremental uh, kind of feedback that they that they might need or want, especially as a machine could utilize to help improve over time. Because again, the machines are not inherently evil or negative, uh, but they but they can be self-correcting in ways that humans uh, do not respond to. So anyway, uh, in the short term, machines can be encouraged to program plans that they are confident can be performed with required precision which is good for predictability. And long-term, honestly, another interesting thing is that it rewards those machines that uh, can sense and maneuver more precisely in the system. So it sets up an evolutionary process that the machines that can uh, maneuver and utilize uh, leftover space, let's say out of a maneuver plan without having necessarily cause conflict with anybody else uh, are rewarded, right? So they uh, are compensated in the system indirectly by not having to outbid another machine for priority. So for example, you think about a big truck versus the burrito bot, the burrito bot may just never bid and just wait to see after all the big machines have moved, what space is left and then exploit that space because it's highly maneuverable, it takes up only a small amount of space and can easily accelerate, decelerate and wait for the other machines to get out of the way uh, to get through the system. So that inherently says, hey, there's a role in that uh, in that ecosystem for small, highly maneuverable uh, machines that can exploit leftover space, uh, which we would never get uh, if we stick with the with the human uh, legacy. You know, every lane is 11 feet wide, and the you know, go with its lights are red. You know, stop when lights are red, and go when lights are green, and so forth. Um, fault accounting discourages highly erratic behavior. So in any way, the the way I feel like. Uh, trust works is very incremental future looking fault is to stay away from like the very negative uh, performance in the system. So in this case, uh, the fact that you are not only uh, liable for the cost of collision, let's say, which is kind of what we do now, but you are the, the machines themselves are reliable for the economic cost of disruption of the plan highly incentivizes uh, both improved sensor systems as well as predictable behavior uh, from the machines in the system. So uh, whether or not that's a machine-based thing or the where the design, it does give them the steady feedback that they would need from the trust-related stuff to also potentially avoid the, um, the more dramatic collision type stuff, which would be the highest, uh, disincentive, you know, highest disincentive from fault allocation in the system. And finally, my point here is that the infrastructure, I'm not a lawyer, so I guess I should have said at the beginning, so that you know, legally how all this works out is, is difficult, but just from a conceptual framework, I think it's interesting that the infrastructure-based sensors could also have a role uh, in not necessarily controlling the system, but, but, in, but in illuminating the area uh, to make sure that trust uh, scores and fault allocations are made correctly 
and that they're correctly incentivizing the, the system. And in the end, again, what, what I'll say about all this is that if you can engineer this correctly, an engineered system rather than a, a, an ad hoc system that has grown up over 100 years, we can have benefits like not killing 35,000 people a year uh, and getting a lot more efficient utilization out of the roadway system. And this is you know, only when the machines themselves have taken over. There are very few human drivers in the system are able to utilize that uh, roadway space in ways that humans would never do or could never do, including the utilization of the shoulders uh, at all times. Uh, the the uh, utilization, for example, uh, right now we have bridges that are three lanes northbound, three lanes southbound. That's always fixed. It can never be changed. Uh, but in such a system like this, where we remove all that legacy constraint, machines can allocate northbound, southbound lanes as needed, depending on the directionality of traffic. So that's where we get a lot of the extra productivity is the flexibility moving beyond the, the rigid and uh, legacy uh, mechanisms that we have now, uh, which are based on the fact that we are kind of, you know, relatively inefficient meat-based uh, perception machines. Uh, we don't wirelessly communicate with our uh, other drivers around us that efficiently. I mean, humans are great. I guess I, I always wanna stop the talk by saying, I, I, I am a human, a lot, of, a lot of my best friends are humans, um, I salute, what we've done in 100 years of automobility, but we're hardly the apex predator for, for driving. But we have the chance to actually engineer and create a system in which we create essentially the apex uh, ecosystem that drives us towards uh, apex driving uh, by use of automation, uh, vehicle automation and, and machines, uh, specially designed and evolved to, to conduct this particular kind of operation. All right. So with that, I'm going to stop talking. 10.49, I'm sorry, Roger, I went a little bit longer, but I have taken some of the comments along the way. So I, should I just jump in and take the, the, the additional comment from Lynn? Yes, absolutely. Go ahead. All right. Uh, all right. So Lynn points out that uh, she used to be a proponent of heavily instrumented roadway for the purposes you mentioned. To talking to many people, really, there's no budget for this. How can the vehicles uh, themselves provide this capability with uh, dark road users in the mix. Right, okay, so so good point. And actually, uh, two pieces on that. Number one is, I think you're exactly right, that heavily instrumented roadways are super expensive, not even just like the capital cost, but just the operating cost, and they're complex, and they have to be maintained, uh, and they require a lot of care and feeding to be effective, okay? So, so the first my first answer to your question is, yes, indeed, with our current mechanisms for funding heavily, highly instrumented roadways, there is, it's super difficult to get that, that funding because right now there's a very tenuous uh, trail between the improvements and efficiency generated by such a, an instrumented roadway and the tax base and the mechanism used to fund it. Uh, if you know a little bit about way roadways are funded, including capital improvements like all these sensors you're talking about, it's essentially driven by total VMT, and then there's a calculation by state, and they're distributed to the DOTs, and it's, it's more like a general tax uh, uh, than it is like a, well, this improvement could pay for itself. It's, it's so indirect. We use, well, I mean, I've, I've been in the, working as a, in, in Washington for over 30 years, almost 35 years now. And you know the the way that we try to talk about those improvements, it's super indirect, right? That it will improve mobility, improve safety, and so therefore we should do it. But there's not a straight tie to like how those things are funded, which always makes it difficult. So I totally appreciate what you what you're saying. So there are two pieces. One is I'd say let's change the way those things are actually funded, uh, and when they actually do cause an improvement, the value they generated, if that could be somehow transfer directly to the machines, you know, from the machines that negotiate for the space, let's say, to the infrastructure that supports the efficient and safe maneuver, then that helps to solve that problem. Okay, but that's, let's just say we don't solve that problem. And we go on to the second part here, and there's no budget for, for this. How can the vehicles themselves provide the capability with dark road users in the mix? Yeah, so in this case, again, a third party helps, right? So if the two rovers A and B are involved in the crash, they essentially have a position to take about fault, right? They're not, even though the machines may, objective, may be objective, the owners of those machines, the humans who have responsibility of those machines are not going to be 
independent or objective. Uh, they'll have, they have a position, they have a dog in the fight. So in this case, uh, what I would say is that we incentivize a system for third parties like other machines, other rovers, uh, to, uh, to have long enough range sensors that they can be an independent third party informing uh, the uh, allocation of fault within the system. And so that's just an interesting like concept of a machine that drives around in the, uh, potentially driving around in the system, maybe to deliver stuff, but also to make, uh, have a side gig as a fault supporting or a trust supporting entity. Because that compensation that goes back if it doesn't go to the infrastructure, like a heavily instrumented system, it could go to the entities in the system that circulate and are there and have high trust scores for their uh, ability to allocate trust and allocate fault within the system. So it's a great, great point. Uh, it's actually two great questions in, in one. So bonus there. Uh, Jason Carl, has a Carl, Oh, sure, yeah, go Carl, ahead. No, Carl, you have two more questions and I want to ask a last question about what's next, but go ahead and answer those two questions. All right, I'll, I'll, I'll do it minutes. quick. So um, Jason asks, how does Nobles orchestrated autonomy compare to other orchestration frameworks uh, like open RMF? So, so in this case, uh, I think, you know, our orchestration framework is a sort of a, software framework, but it's also a uh, conceptual framework that touches and reaches out to all the problems in the system, which includes like, how do we generate value and how do we, um, how do we uh, create uh, a revenue stream for, for the infrastructure among other things, right? So I think OpenRMF is a great way of, of looking at it. Uh, you know, orchestrated autonomy could essentially be implemented within such a system, but it doesn't have all those features uh, at the moment. Uh, let's see, I'm gonna go on to Sean here. Do you see fault accounting pertaining to various AV operators? I guess it's a great question. So Cruise or Waymo, is there some sort of charge applied to Cruise or this erratic behavior or is the fault accounting more relevant than relevant than for human drivers, right? So, so it's a great point. So if you assign, in this case, I've made the simplifying argument that fault is assigned to a machine, right? Now within the machine, the AV machine, there's it's a collection of sensors uh, a, 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 an autonomy solution and the way that the humans have programmed or set it up or tuned it, right? So it becomes more complicated once you look inside the machine, like who was at fault within the machine, right? So for right now, my talk is just about how do you allocate fault to a machine? <laughs> so if the, if the machine itself has to do like a, a the way I, I look at this honestly is that the machine itself or the owners of the machine needs to do an accounting of all the things that could contribute to it and try to correct it for, for the next one, right? So in this case, I don't know that fault would then flow into the subcomponents, but fault would then end with the machine. Uh, and then the owner of that machine is the one who's really held liable for it. And then it'll be up to them to then figure out, you know, within the machine, the boundary of the machine, how do we allocate fault? within that complex machine, which is its own super complicated thing. But for right now, that's my pat answer is that I don't, I'm not going inside the machine. So Roger, you have a question. Yeah, so my question, I guess it would be the last one would be, uh, so what's next for your, your research? Are you looking to scale it? Are you looking to make it even better? What yes. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. It's a great open-ended question. So we're working on a, a number of different fronts. And honestly, uh, the orchestration here is has application in a number of civilian and non-civilian use cases. Um, but for the civilian roadway side use case, some of the things we're working on currently is what happens when communications are degraded in the system? Uh, how can the negotiations that occur, like the rovers, by the way, do all that negotiation within a tenth of a second, just based on uh, Raspberry Pis, uh, two Raspberry Pi units built into each one of those things. So it's a super lightweight decentralized solution, which is awesome, uh, but it's dependent on, uh, on uh, pretty good communications. So we are trying to show how uh, strength of communications uh, can be uh, incorporated into the way it works so that it can be more, if can it still be effective even when there's limited communication. So it scales up and scales down the, the basics, the, the essentially the resolution of the path planning that occurs. So that, that's an interesting one for us. And we're also uh, you know, looking at ways that, uh, that humans or an operator like the, the IOO, the roadway operator can also influence the behaviors in the system by injecting 
constraints uh, for their own good, like how, how that can benefit the system in terms of managing, for example, uh, maximum acceleration, deceleration under road weather conditions and those kinds of things. Because not every moment is, is the same on these roads, the traction can be very different. So that's kind of the, some of the directions we're going. And of course, we're also, uh, and we're, we have been uh, really pursuing this uh, financing model because it's of significant concern to our, our clients. So how much revenue could this yield? How much benefit would that look like? And how does that supplement or replace a uh, fuel-based uh, tax going forward? And with that, I think we're out of time. So thanks everybody for the, for the, for the great comments. A very super informed uh, group as always when I talk to the Moby group. And uh, I, I, I appreciate it. I hope to see you all again sometime soon. I'm sure that some of the questions you asked today will end up in, if I'm invited back, if Roger and Grace and others decide that they would like to have me back, I'll sign up to, to uh, tell you more about where we are in, a, in just a, well, I don't know, a year or so from now or whatever the next time I'm invited to come back. You know, I will, you all come, Tramps. So just uh, send the send the invitation. I'm, I'm happy, to, happy to talk. So thanks, everybody. And thank you, Rajat. And I look forward to chatting with you a little bit later this month. Yeah, thank you all for joining. And thank you, Carl, for the great presentation. See you next time.